Hey, hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. Now, by now, you've probably heard the buzz around agents and agentic systems. But what are agents and agentic systems? And how are they different to large language models or even RAG, which took 2024 by rage, right? And more importantly, how can you get started building with agents? Now, this year, we are starting off with a brand new series dedicated to all things agents. We'll have James joining us very shortly, where we'll break down each episode into sections, talking about what really agents are, when, when do you use agents and when do you not use agents, the different patterns behind agents, and more importantly, hopefully, it gives you the ability to start experimenting with agentic frameworks. So stay tuned, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll have a, uh, James join us very shortly. And let's start off with all what what really agents are all about, James. Yeah, so let's have a, a bit of a high level introduction into agents. Um, as you said, you know, it's a, a relatively quite a new field. Um, and as we've seen in the whole sort of AI, gen AI space over the last few years, there's been so many new terms that have been entering our vocabulary. Things like, you know, uh, few shot prompting, rag, whatever that is. Like, you know, a few years ago, we would never have even said these words, and now we use them every day, pretty much. Um, and there's a new one entering the scene, agents. Uh, now, if 2024 was the year of rag, 2025 has already started as the year of agents, and it's only going to get bigger from here. Um, there was always a buzz about it last year, um, and pretty much every single framework provider, they're all shifting towards this. So it's really key that we understand what they are. But as I said, they're quite new. They're evolving quite rapidly. Here at AA, you know, um, we like to do things properly. There's been a lot of confusion over these definitions in the past, but we're starting to crystallize on what they actually are. And now it's time to sit down and put together some proper thoughts on, on what these are and how to use them. Um, but, you know, they come with a lot of caveats. So a good baseline to start on for what an agent is, is there's sort of three main pillars to consider. Uh, the first one is that agents are autonomous. Uh, they can, they're a series of LLMs that can make their own decisions. Um, and that is to achieve the second pillar, which is that they're goal oriented. You know, they pursue specific objectives that they're trying to achieve. Um, and then on the third pillar, they do this by improving. Um, normally iteratively, as you can see, we'll get to a couple of caveats again. Um, but yeah, they, they improve outputs or they improve on what they're doing over time to give the best output possible to achieve those goals under their own decision making. Um, okay. But there's loads of room for, for like, you know, wiggle room and, and different definitions here. Cool. But they all fall into the umbrella of large language models, right? Well, so that's the thing, isn't it? So um, yes, they all include large language models. But as we can see here, there's, there's yeah. sort of different tiers and sub tiers of how we can start interacting with these LLMs. So uh, on the outer level here, you see we've got language models interactions. And that's basically just your your bread and butter, your most simple, straightforward. You send a prompt to a model and you get a response. And that's it for what is a sort of language model interaction. Uh, then moving in a bit, you get workflow systems. So these are things that probably everyone is very familiar with. Um, this sort of starts to incorporate RAG, things like that, where you're um, interacting with language models, but you're also enriching it with other things. For example, RAG, you're adding in stages where you go off and you search for relevant text and you enrich your prompts with that. And then you go off to the language model. And it's all part of a, a sort of a set uh, DAG style um, workflow, you know? So you go from yeah. step A to step B, to step C. There's different ways to achieve that, but it's all very rigid. Like you will always follow the same structure that you've built um, yeah. and you're sort of yeah, enriching how you interact with the model. Um, but then we start getting down to agentic systems, agents, agentic frameworks. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah. that's when you start seeing, yes, these sort of workflow style systems, be enriching things using RAG, um, having yeah. different steps in your process, but the yeah. agents can then decide which ones they want to do in what, what order, yeah. maybe some not at all, maybe some several times, and it starts getting a lot more dynamic as a whole system. That makes sense. That makes sense, James. But you know, even you, so you spoke about RAG, and there's also now there's a new trend in terms of incorporating agents within a RAG framework. And there's still an awful lot of confusion in terms of what really an agent is. I was just hoping that you can explain, you know, when you're starting to implement RAG, starting to play around with agentic frameworks, can how do you distinguish what really is an agent? 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's a brilliant question, you know. Um, we've been using this term a lot so far, agent. Um, yeah. And there's quite an interesting idea floating around that actually calling something an agent, that's a noun, you know, is this an agent, is it not? Um, and as we've seen, there's a lot of questions that come when you're trying to ask, is my system an agent or not? Uh, for example, you know, can it make its uh, can it make decisions? If it does, can it make its own decisions? What does its own decisions even really mean when it's a, a computer program, essentially? Uh, you know, can it improve? Um, can it refine its responses? There's loads of different questions that we can start asking, and inevitably people start arguing over what the answer is. Um, so rather than thinking of it as is this an agent, yes or no, it's probably better to think of it as is it agentic. Um, and that means that we can kind of have a sliding scale. So some systems might be, you know, not at all agentic. They don't really do any of the stuff that we talked about. Some might be incredibly agentic and they do loads of it and it's like almost fully autonomous. And then there's going to be a lot of stuff in between where, yeah, it's making some decision making, but the decisions are quite limited and we've predefined what the different options are. Or, yeah, yeah sure, it can improve, but it can only improve so much. Like we've only put in so much of this. Um, and so that's where we can start thinking instead about agentic frameworks as a more sort of, um, rather than a solid definition, it's more just an idea that systems can fit into. Our kind of uh, five, five or so patterns, um, again, you know, these kind of start to meld into each other after a while. We'll go into the details in a future video, so stay, in, stay in, uh, tuned for that. Um, but for now, we're just going to... Um, mentioned that the five main ones are sort of routing, tool calling, that's a big one, uh, one that I particularly like, I think that's got a lot of potential. Multi-agent is the one that has the most buzz at the moment, you'll hear loads of stuff about multi-agent uh, frameworks, reflection yeah. and planning. So there's kind of like the main the main routes um, that agentic systems tend to take and this all kind yeah. of comes under an umbrella of a new term as well, just to throw into the mix, of React. Uh, now that's not the React that you're probably thinking of, it actually stands for reasoning and acting. And that's basically how agentic frameworks have sort of um, started to, to come into being, this sort of cyclical uh, reasoning what's there, what is required of them and acting based on what's available to them. Okay, James, I know there's lots of benefits and equally, there's also a lot of drawbacks in terms of incorporating an agentic framework. I'm just wondering whether you can very quickly go into, you know, what's the, what's the benefits of incorporating agentic frameworks and what, what are the drawbacks as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, as you say, this is a very, uh, very deep topic. We'll be getting into this a lot in a lot more detail. Uh, if this video piques your interest, there'll be more videos coming out where we go into more of like the whys of all this. Um, but some very high level benefits of when you should consider using an agentic framework. Um, first one is performance. And I mean this in terms of sort of, you know, the accuracy of your outputs. Um, it's been proven previously that using models in a sort of agentic fashion can actually outstrip the performances between generations of models. And what I mean by that, for example, um, it was shown that an agentic framework of GPT 3.5 models uh, could outperform GPT-4 on various yeah. benchmark tests. Um, yeah. And you know, there's, there's uh, benefits and drawbacks to doing it in that way, but it means that you can do more with what you've got. I'm actually seeing agents as a bit of a solution to the, the kind of plateau in model performance, you know, the models can, the big models out there can only get so big and there's only so much data to train on. Uh, and yeah. some people are concerned that the models are starting to plateau in terms of performance. Agents yeah. are a way around that because you're then starting to use different models to interact with each other and boost yeah. performance as a, as a whole, dare I say, and, uh, with synergy. <laughs> and also, I've also seen a trend where people are starting to incorporate small language models within an agentic framework. Yeah, and that has loads of benefits as well, you know, cost benefits, even you can start to get into the environmental benefits, you're using way smaller models to achieve what bigger models can achieve. So there's loads of things to consider there. Um, another benefit of agents are the autonomy, you know, they can, they can fix their own mistakes, they can overcome obstacles, they're not, uh, they're not like super intelligent, they can't do absolutely everything. But mm -hmm. it's a better shot at overcoming issues, particularly when systems are quite uh, changing or dynamic. Uh, particularly things involving things like code generation or back and forth with customers, um, yeah. where a previous workflow might just fall down because it hits an error or it doesn't know what to do next. But yeah. an agent can kind of start to make those decisions of how to overcome those issues. Um, but finally, I just want to touch on the, the flexibility of agents. I know we've already di discussed it a bit, but um, yeah, the ability to sort of start combining LLMs, their creativity, their ability to problem solve with the deterministic predictability of things like just, you know, straight up 
functions or uh, mathematical models that you know work every single time. You can start melding them together as well when you use agents. So there's so many there's so many um, benefits to them. Just a really high level. When should I consider agents? If yeah. your use case is complex, dynamic, or quite temperamental, as we discussed, agents are yeah. great. You know that level of creativity and uh, problem solving ability, fabulous. When you should you not maybe consider agents? That's when you know your your system needs to be very um, very robust. It's imperative that it works correctly. Uh, you want a budget. Agents can get quite expensive, which we'll get into. Yeah. Uh, and production grade as well. You know we've discussed. It's literally changing every single week. Before a couple of hours ago, before we even started this video, Gabby and I were talking about a new framework which has just been announced. Yeah. It happens every yeah. week. Um, yeah. <laughs> there is no guarantee that what exists right now will exist in this current state in a year or two's time. It's changing all the time. So if you need something solidly reliable, maybe yeah. you know start start looking into agents, but don't go straight into production with them. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Also, it also affects latency, right? So using an agentic framework definitely has an effect on how quickly you're getting the response because it's constantly looping around making sure it's doing something very well so that that affects latency exactly and that's where performance driven it depends that actually means it depends on the definition you know performance in terms of your output agentics are great for that performance yeah. in terms of your latency yeah agents can sometimes dwell a bit so um so yeah, it's it's good to consider these things as well yeah. um and just some some key points that I think are worth taking away from this video. Uh, yeah, so the, sort of the three main points, which I think are, are worth remembering are other models are available. We didn't really get onto that as much, but you know, you can use different models throughout the agentic framework, which means you can optimize your your costs and um, yeah, your, your, your latency and your usage and also what models are best for what. So guard railing, we've touched on that. You can use like high reasoning or fine tuned guardrail models. Um, summarization, you can use a lot smaller models that are maybe a lot cheaper, a bit quicker, but they're great for summarization. And then the user proxy, the orchestrator, like the brain of the agent, um, that's when you want something really high reasoning. It doesn't get used as much, but when it does, it packs a punch. Um, so, you know, you can sort of uh, mix and match these models for whatever your use case is. Make a checker patterns as well. That's definitely something that's worth uh, remembering. This is the whole idea of agents uh, where you essentially say, write me a thing suggest improvements for this thing. This is quite uh, quite a low low agentic um, solution. It sort of is more towards the workflows end, but I would still classify it as loosely agentic, um, but it's in absolutely everything in an agentic system. It's definitely a great one to, to consider yeah. as like a first step. And yeah. finally, as we said, you know, agents are a pattern, not a technology. You don't have to do everything in hard and fast ways. Just pick and choose what works for you. Whatever Absolutely. is best for your solution, just make sure you understand it, keep it simple, and make sure it achieves the goals that, that you need from it. Right. James, so there's, I know there's loads and loads of frameworks out there in terms of getting started with a genetic framework. Have you got any suggestions in terms of people, for people, if they're wanting to start learning about agents and start using some easy to use, easy to understand frameworks out there to get started? Yeah, so there's you know a plethora of frameworks that are changing all the time. So this could be out of date a week or two after we make it. But as things stand at the moment, um, yeah. you know anyone who's worked with LLMs must know what Langchain is. Langchain have some brilliant agentic um, frameworks and libraries already in existence that you can just install and get going with. Um, there's also LangGraph to consider. This is like the the next stage of Langchain. Uh, and it's particularly great for agentic, uh, agentic flows. So it's definitely worth checking that out as well. Uh, we've got Swarm. So Swarm is an open AI backed um, framework. It's more for education. I don't think they ever really intend to put it into production, at least not at the moment. Um, but it's really great for learning how these sorts of multi-agent systems work and how agents work individually. Uh, and then the same for Autogen and Crew AI. Uh, two other great libraries for multi-agent uh, development and sort of getting to grips with things. So I'd say these are some great places to start. And then you've also just got um, as your AI Foundry, the recently rebranded um, uh, AI um, hub in Azure. And then you've also got Databricks Mosaic. Both of these have some great resources for making agentic systems, testing them out, and then getting them into a into a sort of a deployment ready state. Uh, so if you want to start playing with them, if you've got access to Azure or Databricks, then definitely worth checking them out as well. And also, I can't wait to get into how do we start implementing some of the 
agents that we spoke about, you know, how do we really get it into um, productionization or how do we start playing around with it? That, that would be, you know, yeah, that's where the fun is, right? So in next episode, tell me what we're going to be covering then, James. So in the next episode, we're going to be going into those, those sort of five main patterns that we talked about earlier. We're going to be having a high level look at what they are, not the code yeah. level. We're not doing demos just yet. That'll be in a future video. Um, yeah. But we'll be give, getting you to grips with what these actually are and what they might look like in a, in a given sample system and a few more um, details in terms of the benefits and drawbacks of agents in general. Brilliant. So stay tuned and we'll see you very soon.